Jeremiah chapter number 25. And I don't know if we're going to get all the way through this chapter tonight or not. This might be a, a two-part chapter. There's a lot of other verses that we need to turn to tonight to understand some of what is going on uh, in Jeremiah chapter number 25. And I just want to remind us again as we study the book of Jeremiah that the book of Jeremiah is not written in chronological order. Uh, many times uh, stories are, are, are not in order, they're according to topic. And uh, so I want you to see that and want you to remember that uh, as we study the book of Jeremiah. There are five main kings. If you'll learn these five kings, and again, I know it's hard to remember some of these names, but uh, if over the course of the next 25 weeks you can memorize some of these kings, you'll really uh, understand the book of Jeremiah a whole lot better. And so again, let me ask again, who was the only good king mentioned in the book of Jeremiah? And he's the first king. Does anybody remember? Josiah. Josiah. Oh, that's good. That's a lot of people. Josiah was the only good king mentioned in Jeremiah as far as the kings of Judah are concerned. Right after Josiah was his fourth son known as Jehoahaz. He had another name too. I don't want to confuse us with that other name. But uh, Jehoahaz is the name he's mostly known by. So jo Josiah, then Jeho Jehoahaz. Then the third son, the third uh, king rather, is Jehoiakim. He was the second son of Josiah. And Jehoiakim was a wicked king. He reigned uh, for 11 years. But he was a wicked king. He uh, used and abused people. Uh, he was a bloody king. Uh, he was a king who despised the word of God. We're going to see that again a little bit tonight. And then the fourth king uh, was Jehoiachin, or Jeconiah, or Coniah, the same person. And he was the grandson of Josiah. And then the fifth, the last king, was Zedekiah, and he was the third son of Josiah. And so this, uh, this evening, we, could, we look at Jeremiah 25, verse number 1. The Bible says, The word that came to Jeremiah... Concerning all the people of Judah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Again, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, it's the same person, variant spelling, same person. Notice, this happens during the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Who's Jehoiakim? He's that second son. He's the third king. And again, we may not remember all this tonight, but over the course of 25 weeks, hopefully we'll remember all five of these. But Jehoiakim was a wicked king, and so this is taking place in Jehoiakim's fourth year and in Nebuchadnezzar's first year as the king of Babylon. And uh, so that is the context. Just a reminder about who Jehoiakim is. Keep your finger here in Jeremiah 25. Look over in Jeremiah 36. We've looked at this passage a little bit before. I just want you to see a little bit about who Jehoiakim is, what his attitude is towards the Word of God and towards Jeremiah and towards preaching. And uh, we'll see this here in Jeremiah chapter 36. Look at verses 1 through 3. It says, It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So if you can, flip back to Jeremiah 25. Look at both of these. Jeremiah 25, this passage we're about to read took place in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, and you're going to find Jeremiah preaching to Jehoiakim. Well, go to Jeremiah 36. This also is in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. The Lord didn't just want Jeremiah to preach this word. He wanted it written down. Uh, don't you love that verse that says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy? We weren't just... We didn't just hear a voice from heaven. Remember what Peter said? He said, I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I heard God's voice. Remember when Peter said that. But then what did he say? He said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What's he talking about? The written word of God. Peter said, we have a written word. Uh, we like written word. Uh, I know people say, well, I wish we could go back to the day of a handshake. You know, I'll buy this car from you and I promise I'll make the payments. Let's just shake hands on it. No, folks, nowadays, what do you really need? You need to have a written agreement. If you didn't know that, file that away. You need a written agreement. You need it in writing. Well, God didn't just give us a verbal commitment. He gave us His written Word. He wrote it down for us. So here in Jeremiah 25, God says to Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, go preach this 
to Jehoiakim, but also we see in Jeremiah 36, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, he wants him to write it down. Look at verse 1 of chapter 36. It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations. From the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. And we're going to see when we go back to Jeremiah 25 that that's been 23 years of preaching. Jeremiah has been preaching faithfully the Word of God for 23 years. Verse 3, he said, write it down. He said, verse 3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Now, look down in verse 9. So they wrote it down. You can read more about that uh, throughout Jeremiah 36. They penned down the words that God had told Jeremiah to preach, and they penned them down. Beirut helped pen those words down. Verse 9. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So now uh, a, at least one year has passed, probably more than a year. Because notice, it's in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem, and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. Then read Baruch in the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. So... God sends Jeremiah to preach. While he sends him to preach, he says, write it down. Put it in a scroll. Uh, at, least, at least a year has passed. They call a fast. They read the book. They read the words of God to God's people. Look down now in verse number 20. Again, you can get the entire story, and we'll study it more when we get to Jeremiah 36. But look at Jeremiah 36, verse 20. The Bible says, And they went into the king, into the court, that's Jehoiakim, the one that we're talking about in Jeremiah 25. They went in to the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. They didn't want to bring the roll with them, probably because they knew what the king would try to do or would do to the words. Verse 21, so the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll. And he took it out of Elisha, the scribe's chamber, and Jehudai read it, in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife. He had read three or four pages of this book. He cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments. They didn't tear their garments. Neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. They had no fear of God. They had no fear of God's word. Can you just imagine taking the word of God and just cutting it to pieces and throwing it in a fire? But that's exactly what these people did. They had no fear of God. They had no fear of God's word. And by the way, the Lord says to this man, why look to him that trembleth at my word. The Lord wants people who will take His word seriously. Look at verse 27. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that the king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying, Take thee again another roll. You can burn the book. That doesn't change the truth. You can try to get rid of the word of God, but you're not going to be able to do it. He said, Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast? Well, why had he written that? Because that was God's word. That's what was going to happen. Just because we don't like something in God's word doesn't mean it shouldn't be there. Verse 30, Therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, 
And his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them. But they hearkened not. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Uriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words. Go back with me, please, if you would, to Jeremiah 25 again. Jeremiah 25, what we're reading is during that fourth year of Jehoiakim, the same year God told Jeremiah, have these words written down. And it's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Notice verses 2 and 3. Jeremiah said, I've been preaching faithfully for 23 years. Verse 2, to which Jeremiah the prophet spake, unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Amon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, that the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight. May we learn something about this book, about these people. The Holy Spirit, as we always ask, apply your word to our hearts tonight. Show us our need tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. He said, for 23 years I've preached this word, but you haven't hearkened. Remember Jeremiah 6.16, the, the key verse for the whole book. The Lord told the people, He said, ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and ye shall find rest for your souls. And what did they say? We will not walk therein. You read a verse or two later, they said, we will not hearken. We won't listen to the Word of God. And notice, Jeremiah reminds them. He said, I've been preaching faithfully for 23 years. Look at verse 4. And the Lord hath sent unto you all His servants. Notice, His servants, the prophets. His preachers were His servants. They were God's servants doing God's bidding, preaching His Word. Verse 4, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. He said, you haven't listened, but not only that, you haven't even bent your ear to hear. You haven't even inclined your ear. Verse 5, they said, what were they preaching all these years? Turn ye again now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever and go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Let's think, what is God asking of these people that they haven't been willing to do? He's just asking them to listen. He's asking them to hearken. He's asking them to pay attention to what He's saying. Folks, God is not difficult to deal with. He's not difficult at all. He's merciful. He's gracious. All He wants is for us to listen. He wants us to hearken to what He's saying. Don't you want the same for your children? Doesn't it frustrate you when you try to tell somebody something and you know something's good for them and you know it's going to be a blessing for them, but they won't even hear what you have to say? They just won't even listen. That's what frustrates God. He wants to give us the best. He wants our lives to be blessed. And He's given us a whole book full of precious promises and He wants us to listen to what He has to say. But they would not listen to God's servants, the prophets. So God said, okay, you won't listen to my servants, the prophets. Then I'm going to send another one of my servants. This servant is just as much a servant as the prophets were servants. Look at verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words at the mouth of his servants, the prophets. Verse 9. Behold, I will send. And take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. You know, some people don't want the government to have any part in their lives. But the fact is that God established government as well. Even, even wicked government. God allows people to rise to power. And by the way, uh, our type of government can only work with a godly people. It can only work with a godly people. When God's people or, or people who have liberty use their liberty for wickedness, the liberty gets taken away. 
So God said here, he said, I sent my servants, the prophets, but you wouldn't listen. So now I'm going to send my servant Nebuchadnezzar. And whether you want to listen or not, you will listen. He'll force you to follow my will and my way. Notice he said, I will send and take all the families of the north and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and in hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. He said, you're not going to hear laughter. You're not going to hear rejoicing in this land anymore. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. There won't be marriages and, and celebrations, wedding celebrations here. The sound of the millstones, your work will be gone. Your economy will be bankrupt. You won't hear the sound of millstones anymore. And the light of the candle, your crops will fail and the light of the candle. You won't have... Uh, you won't have uh, time at night with your family. You won't even, uh, you'll be in darkness. Verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. This is a very important prophecy. Jeremiah said for 70 years they're going to serve the king of Babylon. By the way, Daniel, when you read the book of Daniel later on, he's reading the book of Jeremiah. He's reading what Jeremiah penned down, the scroll, when he discovers it's going to be 70 years that, that uh, Judah will be uh, taken away, exiled into, into Babylon. And he's reading these words right here. These nations. Well, what nations? Well, Judah. He's speaking primarily to Judah. But you're about to see a whole list of nations that God sends Jeremiah to preach the similar message to. Notice he said, you will serve Judah and all these other nations I'm about to send you to, Jeremiah. You're going to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Now why 70 years? Well, the Bible says the days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score, that's 70 and 80. Yet is there is strength soon cut off and we fly away. But the reason God said 70 years specifically, and this is what I want to spend a little bit of time on, then this is something we need to understand. Look at 2 Chronicles. Keep your finger here. We'll come back to Jeremiah 25. Look at 2 Chronicles. We're going to turn to several passages right now. Just remember that number, 70 years. And again, that's what Daniel was reading when he discovered it would be 70 years uh, that Judah would be in exile. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Look at verse number 15. 2 Chronicles 36. If you read 2 Chronicles 36, it's a culmination of the final destruction of Judah. I mean, it sums up what happened to them if you read the entire chapter. For sake of time, we won't read the whole chapter, but look at 2 Chronicles 36, verse 15. The Bible says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by His messengers, those are His prophets, His servants, the preachers, rising up betimes and sending. Why did He do it? Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans. That's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Chaldeans, Babylonians, same thing who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion. Notice God said, I sent you my preachers and I wanted you to hearken. I wanted you to listen. Why? Because I wanted to have compassion on you. But you wouldn't listen to the compassion, so I sent someone who had no compassion. That was Nebuchadnezzar. He had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon and they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all all the goodly vessels thereof, and them that had escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons, until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. 
the kingdom of Persia, the Medes and, the, uh, Medes and Persians, they're the ones that overthrew Babylon. But until that time, they were serving and carried away to Babylon. Now notice verse 21. Why? Why did all this happen? Verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now what does that mean? Well, we're going to look at what that means right now. He said the reason this happened was to fulfill the word of the Lord that came by Jeremiah so that the land could enjoy her Sabbaths. Because while the people were out of the land, the land enjoyed its Sabbath. Okay, well, what is he talking about? The Sabbath. Look at Exodus 23, please. Exodus 23. This is a law God had established for the children of Israel. Look at Exodus 23. And by the way, I want to remind us about Sabbaths. Uh, a Sabbath is not an end in and of itself. In fact, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, they teach that we ought to be observing the Sabbath on Saturday. Folks, we shouldn't be observing any Sabbath. The fact is we have an eternal Sabbath in Jesus Christ. And if you read the book of Hebrews, that's what that's all about. We have rest in Jesus Christ. But all throughout the Scripture, God put forth pictures. He put forth uh, analogies. He put forth types and shadows to show us pictures of the rest we have in Jesus Christ. And one of those was a Sabbath. Now I want you to see, the Sabbath wasn't just for man. The Sabbath wasn't just that every seventh day you were to rest. The Sabbath was also for the land. Think of, a, think of an agricultural system. Think of a farming community. By the way, we still do this to some degree, and we should, to some degree to this day. How many of you have heard of rotating crops? Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay, you don't just... Plant and plant and plant and plant and plant in one field. You rotate crops. You let a field rest sometimes. You change the crop from time to time. Why? So that the nutrients can go back into the ground. Well, God told the children of Israel, and again, what's the big deal about this? The big deal is that the Sabbath was the picture of the rest that we have in the Lord. But look at Exodus 23. This was a law God had established for the children of Israel. Exodus 23, verse 10. He said, in six years... Thou shalt sow thy land. He said six years, go out and plant seed, plant your crops. Verse 10, and shall gather in the fruits thereof. And by the way, notice this wasn't just for the purpose of letting the land rest. This also was about letting people rest. This was also about allowing people to have some blessings. We're going to see that in a minute. Verse 11, but the seventh year, thou shalt let it rest, the land. Let it rest and lie still. Why? Why? that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. So not just a rest for mankind, but a rest for the land. Every seventh year they work to work the land. Whatever just happened to grow of itself, they were to let it grow. And the poor of the land could go and work. We've been looking at it that in Sunday school, uh, in the book of Ruth, God didn't have a welfare program. He had a work program whereby the poor could go out and work. By the way, the Bible still says that if any would not work, neither should he eat. The Bible still says that. It's very important that people learn to work. It's very important that children and teens learn to work. That people don't just have things handed to them with no cost. And so Jeremiah... Uh, uh, or rather the Lord told them in Exodus 23, He said, you're to allow your land to have a Sabbath. Look at Leviticus chapter 25. And by the way, I dare to say that most of us in this room are conservative, sp uh, speaking of politics and of uh, uh, the way we think. I think we think conservatively because that lines up more biblically than uh, what we would now call progressive does. Uh, but let me say this, we need to be very careful about something. We live in a capitalist society, and that's a whole lot better than communism, folks. And that's a whole lot better than socialism, so don't ever mistake uh, that. But listen, there is a problem if we're not careful with capitalism. There is a problem if we're not careful, careful with extreme wealth. And that is that we develop this attitude towards the poor, towards all the poor, that says... Well, if they just worked as hard as I do, they wouldn't have the same trouble I had. Now again, what's the balance? The balance is, if someone doesn't work, they shouldn't be eating. 
Uh, the Bible says consider the cause of the poor. Just because somebody wants some of your money doesn't mean you should give them some money that God's entrusted to you. That being said, though, you do need to check your own heart and ask, do I have a heart that's willing to help if God wants me to help? Do I have a heart that's willing to give? And yes, people will abuse that from time to time. But we ought to have a heart of giving. Jesus Himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this Sabbath that the Lord established was for the purpose of helping the truly poor. Now again, let, let me clarify this because we live in the wealthiest nation in the world. So when I talk about truly poor, I'm not saying they can't get cable TV and they're poor. I'm not saying they go out and eat three, four, five times a week at a restaurant they can't pay their bills because they... Look, let me just, I'm going to vent here a little bit. you got to bear with me for a minute. I remember we had a time somebody came and they said, they said, Pastor, we're really hurting for money. And you, maybe you wouldn't be, but you may be surprised how many times a week the church gets asked to pay people's bills. You'd be amazed. And they said, we're really hurting for money, this and this and this. And I said, well, then let's sit down and talk about this. And I found out they couldn't buy food for their children, but they had bought food for their dog. And they had taken their dog to the vet. Folks, that's called wrong priorities. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to someone who says, I can't pay this bill and that bill, but they're paying for cable TV every month. That's wrong. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to hand you anything. You go cancel your cable, use that money to buy some groceries for your kids. So, again, there's a balance here. But what I'm saying is, be careful that you don't get so hard-hearted because people will mistreat your generosity. Be careful you don't get so hard-hearted towards everybody. Uh, we've all been burned before. How many of you have been burned before when you've helped somebody? I've been burned before. I I've told you the story. I was a college student, and uh, I was on my bus route down in Smoketown. Does anybody know where Smoketown is? I was in Smoketown. And right there around Caldwell Street and uh, what was it, Caldwell, and I think Breckenridge or somewhere right in that area. And I was visiting and I was knocking on the door. Actually, I was on Shelby Street when I first met this guy. He was going door to door and he had a little styrofoam cup in his hand. And he said, hey, he goes, hey, excuse me, brother. He called me brother. He goes, did you hear about that house that burned down? I'm like, no, I didn't hear about it. He said, that was my house. I went, oh, you're kidding. He goes, yeah, we lost everything. He said, I'm, I'm looking for a little bit of help. Can you help me? And I said, and I'll do what I can. I went, I was a college student. And I've told you some of my pitiful college student stories. I went to my Bondo colored sable station wagon, Bondo and blue. And I dug through the seats and I dug and I got as much change, all the money I had in the world. It came to like $2 and something cents. And I dug all that change out and I put it in the guy's cup. And I gave him a track, too. So that was a good thing. A couple hours passed. I was still on the bus route, and I was visiting. And I was talking to this group of kids just you know, a few blocks away from where I'd been before. And I see that guy walking up the street. He has a bottle of beer that big. He's smoking a cigarette. He's going, and, 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 you know, he's one, one swig, one puff. And I got mad. I got really mad. And I went, hey! And I yelled at him. And uh, <laughs> the boys, they go, you know that guy? I said, yeah, I know him. And they said, oh, he carries a big knife like this with him. And I went, oh, okay. God bless you. you know? no, I, didn't say, I didn't say anything else to him. Man. But he burned me. I mean, he, you know, that's wrong. That's wicked for somebody to do that, to abuse somebody's generosity like that. It's wicked. And it's wicked for people to go pay cable TV bills and, and, uh, and enjoy hobbies but not feed their kids. That's wicked. That's wrong. Amen. Now that being said, yes, there are some bad apples out there. We ought to have a heart that says if God presents a need to me that I can help with, I'm going to do it. Now this is part of what this Sabbath for the land was about. Look at Leviticus chapter 25. Again, we're going to read a lot of passages here. But Leviticus 25, verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. The land shall keep a Sabbath. Verse 3, Six years thou shalt sow thy field. Plant your fields, 
six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed. For it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. All right, some of you kids, what's seven times seven? Uh-oh. How many of your brains are already fried from math today? Some of these guys are now in school doing algebra. Like, you can hear the brain crying. What's seven times seven? Anybody know? 49. 49. Very good. Notice verse 8. Seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee 49 years. There it is. So every seventh year, he said, let your land rest. Don't sow it. Uh, don't, don't plant let it grow of its own accord. Let it be for the poor of the land. Let them go out and work. Verse 9. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year. So there were two years in a row. That forty-ninth year and the fiftieth year. that were It was a double Sabbath. Where you just let your land rest. And, well, how in the world are we supposed to live? Well, they ask that question, and the Lord answers it here in just a minute. No, but notice, He says, It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. We looked at this in the book of Ruth. If a man became poor and he had to sell off his land, it would return to him in the year jubilee. If he were uh, uh, sold into service, he would be free in that year of jubilee. Uh, notice, uh, verse uh, 11, A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. And uh, look down in verse uh, 17. He says, Ye shall not therefore oppress one another. But thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety, and the land shall yield her fruit. And ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein in safety. Verse 20, and if ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Okay, so we only sow for six years, what are we supposed to eat in year seven? Behold, we shall not sow, nor gather in our increase. If God told them not to do something, is it for their benefit? It's always for their benefit. Remember on the seventh uh, day when He told them, take a break on the seventh day, don't gather manna on the seventh day, I'll give you a double on the sixth day. Remember the guy who gathered manna? What happened? It bred worms and stank, the Bible said. God said, I'll take care of you. Notice, they said, what shall we eat the seventh year? Uh, Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Verse 21, He said, that I will command my blessing. How many of you want God's blessing? Sometimes God tells you to do things that don't make financial sense. It doesn't make financial sense to say, I'm going to sow six years and then leave it the seventh year. But it makes total sense when God said, I'll bless you if you do this. It makes total sense. It's faith. God said, just believe me, trust me. Let it sit the seventh year and I'll bless you. Notice he said, uh, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. And it, the sixth year, shall bring forth fruit for three years. Isn't that amazing? By the way, stop and think about that for a minute. In the sixth year, it was going to bring forth fruit for three years. Well, he had told them in year seven, don't, uh, don't go out and sow, because I'm going to give you enough for three years in the sixth year. What does that speak to? Number one, it speaks to God blessing faith. When you say, God, I'm going to do what you told me to do, God says, I'll bless that. But secondly, it speaks to using wisdom with what God's entrusted to you. He said, I'm going to give you three years worth in the sixth year. So does that mean in year six you should just get all extravagant and spend everything you have? No, that's foolishness. You should have some wisdom. Notice, he said, I'm going to bless you 
for three years. I'm going to give you three years worth in that sixth year. Verse 22. And ye shall sow the eighth year and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in. Ye shall eat of the old store. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. Look over uh, in Deuteronomy 31. What were they supposed to do uh, during that those years of Sabbath where they're letting their land rest? Well, they're supposed to not just sit back and do nothing. One of the things they're supposed to do is focus on their children and their family's spiritual life. Look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 10. He said, I want you to take that time I've given you. I want, to take, I want you to take those blessings I've given you and I want you to use them to invest in your family spiritually. Now again, we live in America that just says, get all you can, get all you can, shove it in your pillowcase, shove it under your mattress. But listen, could it be that there's a lot greater blessing God wants you to have? You have enough. Well, then how about spending some time serving the Lord? You have enough. How about spending some time investing in people? with the Word of God. God told them to do this. Deuteronomy 31, verse 10, Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which He shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together. That sounds like church to me. Gather the people together. Men, women, and children. That's church. And thy stranger. That's church. It's not us four no more. It's gather everybody together. Thy stranger that is within thy gates. Why? That they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. He said, I'm going to give you a Sabbath, but don't just sit back and do nothing. Use that goods, those goods I've given you. Use that time I've given you wisely. Invest spiritually. Invest spiritually. If all you do is invest financially, you're going to get to the end of your life as a pauper. No, invest spiritually with what God's given you. Uh, go now back to Leviticus for a minute. Again, I don't know, we're not going to get through Jeremiah tonight, but this is important to understand why God said 70 years they would be in Babylon. Look at Leviticus chapter 26 now. Leviticus chapter number 26. Leviticus 26, look at verse number 13. Leviticus 26, 13. Notice the Lord is reminding the children of Israel where they came from. Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget financially where you came from. Don't ever forget spiritually where you came from. Don't ever forget those things. Don't ever forget uh, uh, socially where you came from. Realize everything you have is from God's good hand to you. Leviticus 26, verse 13, he says, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. But if he will not hearken unto me. Now, he spends a lot of time talking about the blessings, but notice what he says. If he will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, including the ones we just read about letting your land rest on the seventh year, letting that be for the poor. Verse 15, And if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I, will, I also will do this unto you. You can read all of this that will happen. Well, among the things that will happen, go to verse 32. Look at among the things that will happen. Verse 32, he says, And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Is that what Jeremiah has been saying? That's exactly what Jeremiah has been saying. Is that what's going to happen? That's exactly what's going to happen. Look at verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths. Notice it says, once you don't want to listen to my word and I kick you out of the land, then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths. He said, make sure you take heed to the things I'm telling you to do. Pay attention to them. He said, because if you don't, I'm going to scatter you off the land. 
Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lieth desolate, and ye being your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. He said, if you don't listen to what I'm telling you every seventh year, let it rest and do things the way I've told you, then I'm just going to make you do it by taking you out of the land. Look at Deuteronomy 15, please. And we're going to be done for tonight. Deuteronomy 15. Again, why 70 years? Well, 70 years because for 490 years they had not been observing the Sabbath. The Sabbath for the land. So the Lord said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take you out of the land for 70 years. And then the land can enjoy the 70 years of Sabbath that it should have had. All in a row. 70 years. By the way, that's, that's God's grace too. He could have said, I'm going to take you out for 70 times 7. I'm going to take you out for 490 years. But He said, I'm going to let all the Sabbaths run concurrently. 70 years you, that you didn't observe the Sabbath, that seventh year, I'm going to remove you for 70 years to the land of Babylon so the land can enjoy its Sabbath. It's Deuteronomy 15, look at verses 1 through 11. The Bible says, At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor. Well, wouldn't that be nice if in our culture every seventh year, whatever you borrow was just released? Well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Every seventh year, that's what happened. Notice, he shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother, thine hand shall release. Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. Can I stop here and say, it's, the economy is not the most important thing to vote for in an election. You know why the economy is not the most important thing to vote for? Because God is the one who blesses an economy. Amen. Now again, there are biblical principles that I believe politicians should follow. But, but listen, do we really think that it's just capitalism that's made America great? Folks, it isn't. It's God's blessing. And if we decide we're going to violate God's law, it won't be long before God shuts down all the blessings. Now notice what he says. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. What are we doing? We're borrowing from China. Communist China, we're borrowing from them. He said, you will lend and you won't borrow. Thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Folks, make no mistake about it. The borrower is servant to the lender. Right. Strings get pulled when you owe money. Verse 7, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart. Can I draw that your attention to that? Don't harden your heart. Don't ever get to the place where you look at somebody and go, it's all their fault. You better be careful. Be careful. Thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. Again, I'm not talking about a lazy rascal who won't work. But if there's a need that you can help fill, you need to have that heart that would help do it. Verse 8, But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need and that which he wanteth. Beware. Now this is God warning. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. Boy, God's calling it like it is. Saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand. And thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. What is he saying? He's saying if... If you see that need in year six and you know it's going to be forgiven in year seven, don't you harden your heart against Him. 
Just because you know you're not going to get that money back. Now again, we have to have wisdom. You don't just give to everybody that asks money of you. Every person standing by the side of the road that is asking for money, that's not a call for you to hand out money. Make sure you understand that. You're responsible to be a good steward of what God's entrusted to you. However, the Bible still says, consider the cause of the poor. It still says that. If God shows you a need that's a legitimate need and you can help with it, you should do it. Look at verse 9. Now verse 8. Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need. And that which he wanteth, beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother. And thou givest him naught, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him. And thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Well, this is dealing with the heart, isn't it? What does Matthew 6 say? Where your treasure is, what? There will your heart be also. I, I know this all flies in the face of capitalism. I know it does. I, I know it does. But folks, there's a balance here. Socialism's wicked. That's taking other people's money and giving it up to other people. That's wicked. Communism's wicked. Forcing people to do things that they should have the liberty to decide for themselves. Capitalism is the best economic policy. But even with that, God's people ought to have a heart that says, I'm going to consider how God wants me to manage what He's entrusted to me. Verse 10, Thou shalt surely give Him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto Him. Now don't miss this. Don't miss this. Because that for this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. Have we ever heard that verse that says that when you give unto the poor, you lend unto the Lord. And the Bible says, and that which he hath given, will he pay him yet again. God will pay you back. And by the way, a lot of times it comes when you need it most. And when you're not expecting it. Look at verse 11. Notice what he says. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. This war on poverty, what was that, FDR? Any history buffs? Was that FDR? The war on poverty? Was it Johnson? Lyndon B. Johnson? There's always going to be poverty. There's always going to be some poor. Notice, the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee. He said, because you're going to deal with that forever, there's always going to be someone... Poor, therefore I command thee that thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Why did the children of Israel get taken away for 70 years? Because they hadn't allowed their land to rest. And part of not allowing their land to rest was they wanted to get all they could out of their land without being a blessing to anybody else. Folks, be careful about that. That sin of greed, that sin of covetousness, which is idolatry. Let's Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, and we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way 
He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.